So hello everyone, welcome back to another video in this uh, lecture series. So today we will talk about the anesthetic concentrations of bronchial asthma. We are uh, specif specifically dealing with only the anesthetic concentrations part of the bronchial asthma and the relevant things. Okay, so let us start with the lecture. So what are the anesthetic concentrations in bronchial asthma? So before knowing that, let us know what is the definition of bronchial asthma. So asthma is a heterogeneous disease usually characterized by a chronic airway inflammation. So it is defined by the history of the respiratory symptoms. What are those symptoms? These shortness of breath, chest tightness and cough that vary over time and also in intensity together with variable expiratory airflow limitation. There is a variable expiratory airflow uh, limitation, not inspiratory, it is expiratory. That is why we are having V's. Okay, now let us know a brief pathophysiology also. The person is susceptible uh, to allergens. Okay, it could be dust, it could be any latex allergy or it could be, see, any other allergy which is a foreign body, which is a new antigen to the body and the person keeps exposing to the same antigen. So he will develop a chronic disease in case of chronic asthma patients. So whenever there is a reaction of an antigen, and it is exposed on the mast cell, there is a reaction which will release. Uh, the mast cell is going to release a lot of histamines, many prostaglandins, leukotrienes, interleukins, you know, all the inflammatory mediators. And also there is an increased vascular permeability. So after the release of these, what happens in the trachea and the bronchi, there is an increased uh, mucus production by the goblet cells. And also there is bronchoconstriction. Okay, all these are due to vagal activation again. And this scenario is all seen during the initial phases of the bronchial asthma. When it goes, uh, when it becomes chronic or the person develops, like after six months, one year, he is getting exposed to the same things. There is already an increased vascular permeability, which will cause the immune cell infiltration. Even the immunity is going to be affected, which will cause cytokine reactions, cytokine releases which will uh, further increase the inflammation and lead to edema, airway injury or the bronchoconstriction is more pro, uh, like it is increased. There is airway hyperreactivity. There is also due to the bronchoconstriction, there is a reduced airflow and also there is impaired mucociliary clearance. There is already an increased production of the mucus from the glands and also there is impaired mucociliary clearance. So these occurs in the late phases of the bronchial asthma. Now let us consider that a patient has come to you for a preoperative evaluation who is a known case of asthma. Now why is preoperative assessment important in this case? So number one is to determine the respiratory dysfunction and its magnitude. How uh, is it an acute bronchial asthma, chronic bronchial asthma? How prolonged or how, how from how much duration is the patient having this bronchial asthma? And how is the severity of the disease? Is it relieving with bronchodilators? And also we need to assess it. And also to know the effectiveness of the current therapy, whether the patient is on uh, beta-2 agonist or the patient is on steroids, or it is inhaled, inhalational steroids or intravenous. So what is the route of administration and all we have to know. And also to prepare a suited anesthetic plan for that patient comorbidity. And also the history has to be taken, physical examination has to be done and also certain investigations have to be written to the patient. So in history, what are you going to ask? You are going to ask symptoms like wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, exercise tolerance of the patient, then whether the patient is having a dry cough, any recent respiratory, respiratory tract infection. Recent, the word recent means within two weeks. Within two weeks is recent, okay? and the person is using any drugs like beta-2 agonists or corticosteroids or any inhalers, history of drug allergies like any NSAIDs or ASA or aspirin which is also a allergen with, uh, allergen which can cause bronchial asthma, any history of smoking, smoking history is very important, history of prior exacerbations or any ICU admission to the patient like any uh, bronchospastic episodes in the past okay and any history of mechanical ventilation is also very important. Now. Let us know something about PEFR. Patients with moderate to severe asthma can be provided with a peak expiratory flow rate meter. PEFR meter, you can see the picture in this slide. So these can be used for home assessment of the patient. The patient's peak expiratory flow rate can be found out at the home by the patient himself. 
so he so that he'll know when to go to the hospital and when he is safe at home okay this differentiation can be made using this meter so peak expiratory flow rate is the maximum flow rate which is expressed in liters per minute that is generated during a forceful exhalation starting from a full inspiration patient takes a full inspiration and do a forceful expiration and how much is the maximal flow rate that is developed is known as peak expiratory flow rate and the normal range is 200 to 600 liter per minute in the picture you can see there are areas of red yellow and green and readings are already given on the on the meter you will know what is the red flag and when we have to go to the doctor so in general the peak expiratory flow rate that is less than 80% of the patient's personal best. See, the personal best of PFR is different for different people. It is not same for every person, not same for you and me. So, every asthmatic patient, it differs. So, it should be 80% of the patient's personal best should trigger the administration of an inhaled short-acting beta-2 agonist. Okay, that should be the trigger point for any patient. A PFR that is less than 50% of the patient's personal best should trigger both administration of inhaled short-acting beta-2 agonist and immediate medical attention. The person has to go to the hospital. So in an asthmatic patient with upper respiratory tract infections, that is URTIs, the risk of bronchospasm is very high. Elective surgery needs to be postponed four to six weeks after a respiratory infection till they are asymptomatic, till they are asymptomatic after four to six weeks, it has to be postponed. Since the airway hyperreactivity will persist for several weeks, even after the resolution of the infectious symptoms, not that the symptoms have subsided, you can give the case, till four to six weeks, the body will take time for the uh, everything to get normal, the respiratory tract, the mucociliary clearance, you know, everything has to uh, become normal. It will take four to six weeks, okay? The physical examination. You can see the hyper expansion of the thorax, use of accessory muscles of respiration if any. You have to ask the patient about atopic dermatitis. We look for the skin also if he is having any allergies. On auscultation, you, you can see wheezing in the lung fields. High pitched whistling sounds when breathing out is known as wheezing. When expiratory airflow is markedly decreased, breath sounds are diminished or inaudible. This is a red flag. So whenever you don't find an, uh, don't hear the breath sounds or they are very diminished, there is marked expiratory airflow obstruction which should be taken care of. Now, what are the investigations you can do for this patient? See, airway obstruction can also be clinically quantified at the bedside by measuring the time taken for forced expiration, which is known as forced expiratory time. You can do this at the PAC itself. So it is a simple bedside tool and measured using a stethoscope and a stopwatch. Forced expiratory time is assessed by asking the patient to sit upright and take a deep breath in and out with the mouth open as quickly and as completely as possible. Okay, so the instructor will listen over the upper trachea in the suprasternal notch with the bell of the stethoscope. So the duration of the audible exhalation is timed to the nearest second using the stopwatch. All right. So normally the audible exhalation should be less than six seconds. A forced expiratory time of more than six seconds correlates with a substantially lowered FEV1 by FVC ratio. That will denote that this is an obstructive airway disease and should initiate further investigation. Should initiate further investigation. So you can do this to a patient uh, who has history and how controlled it is or how severe the disease is, you can found, find out by forced expiratory time or patient is a chronic smoker and complains of dry cough and also he is having wheeze at the, uh, on auscultation in the PAC. So you wanted to rule out whether it is an obstructive or restrictive disease, is it due to COPD or bronchial asthma or any other pulmonary fibrosis or anything. So you can do a bedside test called FET test to find out the obstructive cause. So we are talking about FEV1, FEVC. So let us know the basic, what is FEC, what is FEV1 before proceeding any further because these two terms are going to play a very important role for their slides, okay? All right, so what is forced vital capacity? The forced vital capacity is a spirometric manner basically where the patient inhales as deeply as he can and exhales as long as and as forcefully as, he, as possible. And the amount of exhaled air in this manner 
is the forced vital capacity. So inhales and exhales forcefully. What is FEV1? The forced expiratory volume 1 that is in 1 second the amount of air that is exhaled during the FVC manure. You are doing the FVC manure and how much the person has exhaled during the first second or one second is known as FEV1 and it tends to be lower in diseases that obstruct the airway such as bronchial asthma and emphysema or COP. So FEV1 by FVC, what is that? It is used to determine if the patient has a obstructive or restrictive or a normal pattern. So FEV1 by FVC, this ratio will help us differentiate the obstructive from restrictive disease. All right. So one more thing we have to check in the spirometric reading, spirometric profile is that in the spirometry, you can see that there is a pre bronchodilator and post bronchodilator FEV1 and FVC. Okay. The spirometry is frequently repeated after giving a bronchodilator. If either the FAV1 or FVC increases by at least 12%, 12% is the important thing you have to note, or by at least 200 ml, 200 ml from the pre bronchodilator to the post bronchodilator le levels, then the patient is said to have a significant bronchodilator response. Then we can be safe if at all the patient undergoes uh, like uh, underwent a bronchospasm in the middle of the surgery or in the pre-op or the post-op we know that if we give a bronchodilator the patient will recover again from this spasm the spasm relieves okay so that is a good sign now here you can see that fev1 the forced vital capacity is there and fev1 is the forced vital capacity manner in the first second is known as fev1 okay now let us know some differences between the obstructive and restrictive pattern. So we know that asthma is a obstructive pattern disease. That is why FVC is decreased or normal. And FEV1 by FVC ratio is obviously decreased in obstructive disease. And the total lung capacity can be normal or increased in obstructive disease. Okay. But in a restrictive disease, definitely there is some fibrosis. There is a restriction of the chest wall movement. And that is the reason why the total lung capacity is decreased. So the pulmonary function test normalized between the attacks that is asthma attack the patient has occurred like three months ago and again it came after three months so the normal values do not guarantee an uncomplicated perioperative course because the pft is normalized between the attacks so if a normal pft is there it doesn't indicate that the person is absolutely normal and there is no bronchial asthma in him in a chronic case, it can be normal between the attacks. This point is important. Now, what other investigations you want to ask? Arterial blood gas analysis is important during the bronchial asthma attacks, but it can be normal at the baseline. You can look for some hypercarbia and all. Now, moving on to ECG. In ECG, you can have some right atrial or ventricular hypertrophy, acute strain, right axis deviation, and right bundle branch block. Coming to chest X-ray, you can rule out uh, pneumonia or heart failure using the chest x-ray and also hyperinflation of the uh, lung fields and there is increased lung markings can may be seen and the bronchial thickenings may be seen in the chest x-ray. Now patient came to you he was already using some drugs whether he is having a controlled or uncontrolled asthma based on that you will do some drug modifications let us know what are they. So the preoperative drug modifications for a controlled asthma no current symptoms what do you mean by controlled asthma? The patient is having no current symptoms, no change in the symptoms of for the previous six months. There is no history, like history of taking inhaled corticosteroids like buricinide, use of long acting beta 2 agonists like formiterol. So for, for controlled asthma, the intervention is to continue the inhaled corticosteroids and long acting beta 2 agonists. You will continue the drugs for controlled asthma. All right, now if the patient is having uncontrolled asthma, what do you mean by uncontrolled asthma? He has a recent change of symptoms after the admission for surgery or there is a history of rescue short acting beta 2 agonist usage with or without history of taking oral corticosteroids. So there are symptoms, there are recent changes of symptoms, recent exacerbations. Okay, for uncontrolled asthma, the intervention is start inhaled corticosteroids, consider long acting beta 2 agonist for these patients and also give salbutamol short acting beta 2 agonist preoperatively if the patient is not already on long acting drugs and also oral corticosteroids are indicated for 3 to 5 days preoperatively for a uncontrolled asthma 
Now the combined treatment with corticosteroids like methylprednisolone 40 mg per uh, 40 mg per day orally and also beta 2 agonists like salbutamol have improved preoperative lung function and also there is a decrease in the incidence of wheezing following the endotracheal intubation in patients with reversible airway obstruction or with a history of severe bronchial hyperreactivity. So corticosteroid plus salbutamol have been used and studies are really really in favorable that after endotracheal intubation there is decreased wheezing there is no incidence of wheezing and there is no asthma related bronchospastic complications if you give corticosteroid and salbutamol before the intubation in these patients in obstructive airway disease it is also recommended to stop smoking six to eight weeks before surgery to allow the greatest recovery of the endobronchial mucociliary clearance and also to reduce the carboxyhemoglobin levels. So six to eight weeks is the time you need to remember. For an acute exacerbation of asthma, parenteral steroids such as hydrocortisone 200 mg IV stat and methylprednisolone 40 to 80 mg IV per day for five days remain the mainstay of treatment. Okay, we will discuss about acute exacerbation management in the later slides. So moving on, Patients on the systemic steroids, like more than 10 mg prednisolone, this is steroid management. Patient is on preoperative steroids, how will you manage? If he is on more than 10 mg prednisolone for more than two weeks, within the prior six months, then there will be a adrenal suppression, adrenal suppression. So you have to give hydrocortisone 100 mg IV every eighth hourly, along with the usual dose of the steroid during the perioperative period. Along with the usual dose, you will give hydrocortisone 100 mg. Now it is advised that anyone with a preoperative FEV1, forced expiratory volume in the first second, less than 80%, then you have to start steroids preoperatively three to five days before okay now the children presenting with poorly controlled asthma may also require in addition to the beta 2 agonist like salbutamol and also inhaled corticosteroids he should give we should give oral prednisolone 1 mg per kg per day maximum of 60 mg three to five days before surgery or you can also give dexamethasone 0.6 mg per kg 16 mg maximum now the infection should be eradicated using the antibiotics before surgery okay and also fluid and electrolyte balances or imbalances should be corrected before surgery because the drugs which the patient is using like salbutamol uh, you know beta 2 agonist can cause hypokalemia that is why they are used in the treatment of hyperkalemia salbutamol inhalation will cause hypokalemia okay and also you should look for some hyperglycemia and also hypomagnesemia get these investigations done if the patient is on chronic high dose beta 2 agonist and also chest physiotherapy is proven to have some benefit in sputum clearance and bronchial drainage now what is the choice of anesthesia you are done with the PSE okay you have made the patient fit you have taken the consents and everything so choice of anesthesia will be tailored based on the patient based on the procedure based on the clinical assessment and the preferences of the surgeon and the anesthetist both. So the spinal anesthesia is considered to be the safest form of anesthesia in patients with hyperreactive airways because you don't want to do any manipulation to the airway and trigger a bronchospasm. But because the airway instrumentation can be avoided, the still, still there is evidence that the patients will get a asthmatic attack and the reasons can be many. Even in spinal anesthesia, the patient can get a bronchial asthma attack and also there are studies which show that in if 100% or if 100 cases are having bronchospasm during general anesthesia or, or during any surgery okay spinal or general if 100 cases are having uh, bronchospasm in that 30 30% 30 of the cases are not even asthmatic okay they are not previous known cases of asthma but 30% of the cases they are still having bronchospasm that is the incidence okay now an asthmatic patient will have abnormal autonomic nervous system which is responsible for the airway hyperreactivity okay now sympathetic system will cause bronchodilation so when there is a autonomic nervous system dysfunction or abnormality in these patients then definitely it will cause bronchospasm the stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system is implicated in the pathogenesis of asthma we know this vagal we also read that vagal activity is there in bronchial asthma a thoracic sympathetic blockade 
like T two to T four if you are getting a high spinal, which is made by the spinal anesthesia, might trigger an asthmatic attack by influencing the cholinergic ganglia of the lung and the pulmonary blood flow, and by releasing inflammatory mediators. Okay, by releasing inflammatory mediators, when there is a high spinal, there is always a chance of thoracic sympathetic blockade and resulting in the exacerbation of asthma. Now moving on to general anesthesia. Anesthesia all this goal should be minimized to minimize the risk of inciting bronchospasm and to avoid the triggering stimuli. Now what are these triggering stimuli? What do you want to avoid? You want to avoid morphine. We know that opioids, histamine release, and again bronchospasm. Then D tubercurin, atracurium, mevacurium, desflurane, which is an airway irritant, the ester local anesthetics, prostaglandins for LSCS. We you use prostaglandin F2 alpha, the carboprost for LSCS. Okay, after the delivery of the baby. Then also there is vancomycin, protamine sulfate, the PMMA, which is, and also IV contrast agents are also known to cause asthma. Patient may have latex allergy, and fentanyl use should be with caution. Why? Because there are reports which suggest that fentanyl has caused a cough. Fentanyl induced cough is present after an intravenous intravenous bolus of fentanyl. More than 2.5 mg per kg if you give. Sometimes it has caused fentanyl induced cough. Okay, and remifentanyl. Not much reports are available, but it is considered to be safe, and we use fentanyl also regularly. Okay, now what do you give pre medication with? We we'll use midazolam. Okay, point five mg per kg oral to alleviate the anxiety, and also we use IV lignocaine, which will play a very important role in not causing the bronchospasm due to endotracheal intubation. Okay, it will decrease the response, the hypertensive response to uh, endotracheal intubation. Okay, so one point five to two mg per kg IV lignocaine, ninety seconds before laryngoscopy, will suppress the cough reflex and attenuates. Increase in the heart rate and mean arterial pressure. So lignocaine is very, very, very important. Okay, and also inhalational salbutamol puffs, two to four puffs, five to ten minutes before induction will will make you your work very easy. Okay, and inhalational agents they possess bronchodilatory effects. Inhalational agents are very excellent for bronchial asthma patients for induction. Okay, they they decrease the airway responsiveness and attenuate histamine induced bronchospasm. Especially halothin and sevoflurin are found to be very good bronchodilators than isoflurin. Okay, and exception should be made for desflurin because it can lead to increased secretions, increased coughing, laryngospasm, and bronchospasm. Desflurin is better avoided because it is an airway irritant, and especially in children, you must avoid. Okay, now what are the induction agents? Propofol demonstrates an excellent ability to blunt the airway reflexes and also blunts bronchoconstriction. So in hemodynamically stable patients, you prefer propofol than ketamine. Okay, but ketamine is a direct bronchodilator, and it blunts the airway reflexes and it blunts the bronchoconstriction. It is also causes increased secretions. That is a problem, which can again complicate the airway management. You usually stop supplement with glycopyrrolate or atropine when you give uh, ketamine. Before giving ketamine, you give as a pre-medication glyco or atropine. So hemodynamically unstable patients, definitely ketamine is a drug of choice in asthmatic patients. Now moving on to neuromuscular blocking drugs like vecuronium. We have rocuronium, cisatracurium, and pancuronium. Okay, atracurium has to be avoided. Mevacurium and atracurium should be used with caution because it's known to cause histamine release. Okay. Again, in children, depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents like succinylcholine are often avoided, given the risk of hyperkalemic cardiac arrest. If the pediatric patient is already having an undiagnosed myopathy, then you are definitely not going to choose succinylcholine. But definitely, you can use rocuronium if you want to do a rapid sequence induction. Now, inadequate depth of anesthesia at any point can allow bronchospasm to be precipitated. Okay, so anesthetic management with a volatile agent such as iso or sevoflurane confers a protective bronchodilation. This is very important. Now, if the surgery allowed use of non-invasive airway intervention, then definitely face mask is better than a laryngeal mask airway because laryngeal mask airway is going to sit above your above your larynx. It is going to cause the irritation of the pharynx. Okay, so when compared to a supraglottic airway and ET tube. Used for a controlled airway control in children, 
द इंसिडेंस ऑफ द पेरी ऑपरेटिव रेस्पिरेटरी अडवर्स ईवेंट्स was lower with the supraglottic airway use compared to the ET tube or the face mask however there was no statistically significant difference in the incidence of bronchospasm or aspiration between these two groups okay now in selecting a ventilatory mode attention should be given to providing an adequately long expiratory time we put 1 is to 2 which is sufficient long expiratory time to avoid the build up of the intrinsic or auto peep we don't want to develop a intrinsic peep the, there is an expiratory air flow limitation the air settles in the lower alveoli only so it will get inflated it will get inflated it will lead to barotrauma so we don't want that barotrauma to occur we don't want the auto peep to generate okay so we want to give more time for expiration in an asthmatic patient now coming to extubation adequate suctioning under the optimal depth of anesthesia have to be done don't do suction in the lighter planes of anesthesia okay which will again trigger bronchospasm now deep and smooth extubation is recommended if difficult intubation were not encountered neostigmine may contribute to the risk of bronchoconstriction by inhibiting the breakdown of acetylcholine so neostigmine can actually cause bronchoconstriction but we are giving atropine or glycoperylate along with neostigmine which is going to blunt those effects of bronchoconstriction definitely sugamadex is a better choice when you are using rocronim or vicronim if available sugamadex is a costly drug so theoretically sugamadex is more useful than neostigmine if you are giving it in an asthmatic patient moving on to the management of bronchospasm during anesthesia you are on table patient has you have seen that the patient is having bronchospasm well, how will you proceed further now how will you know that there is a bronchospasm there are signs of airway obstruction you will see that on the ventilator there is an elevated peak airway pressure and also there is prolonged expiratory phase and there is a visible slowing or lack of the chest fall okay chest rise and fall is visible slowing the bag will not fill on exhalation immediately shift to whenever you see a rise in the peak airway pressures you see that the saturations are falling or anything shift to manual bag and you will observe uh, than the ventilator you will notice more about the inhalation and exhalation of the patient and the pressures also so auscultation do auscultation to confirm any wheezing or there are any bre- uh, diminished breath sounds uh, if it is a laparoscopic or any other surgery if the is the tube came endobronchial okay there is a decreased or diminished breath sounds on one side also and is there any kinking of the et tube or any kinking of the circuit so you need to check all these or is there any pooling of uh, secretions or anything inside the cavity check all these before confirming that this is due to bronchospasm you need to rule out other causes there is diminished or absent breath sounds if there is a critical air flow limitation now in the capnograph there is a decrease in the slope of phase 2 and increase of the slope of the phase 3 so the capnograph is usually it is like this okay but there is a decrease in the slope of phase 2 and also increase in the slope of phase 3 and there is a fall so there is a shark fin like pattern uh, which is in seen in the capnograph okay shark fin pattern is seen in the capnograph which will indicate that there is a bronchospasm and also you, obviously you can see a fall in the saturation and increased heart rate so what are the differential diagnosis as i previously said is there any mucus plugging of the uh, et tube or the airway and also is there any development of pulmonary edema endobronchial intubation anaphylaxis bronchospasm uh, foreign body obstruction which is uh, dislodged to tooth or anything or is there any tension in pneumothorax okay you need to exclude all these causes now the intraoperative bronchospasm is confirmed and how do you treat i want you to take a screenshot of this slide and keep it with you because it is helpful for you in the future okay treatment of intraoperative bronchospasm deepen the level of anesthesia via the inhalational route mainly okay choose inhalational route or you can use iv route not if it not available or both and administer 100% oxygen now ventilate by hand take the manual bag or the bain circuit okay ventilate at a slow rate of 5 to 6 breaths per minute because you want to give more time for expiration because giving more tidal volumes at high rates can create again an auto peep what is auto peep 
trapping of the gases in the alveoli under the positive pressure the gases are not able to come out and you are giving more tidal volume this will result in a barotrauma since there is airflow outflow airway outflow obstruction for expiration okay now the beta 2 agonist via the meter dose inhaler through airway take this albutamol and give 62 puffs use through the ET tube or you can if it is not available you can use nebulized 5 mg that is 1 ml of 0.5 percent nebulized salbutamol you can use as necessary then give IV hydro, uh, uh, hydrocortisone 200 mg IV 6 hourly or uh, 200 mg stat immediately give then you can also use 125 mg methylprednisolone or 2 mg per kg and then give 0.5 to 1 mg per kg if it is a pediatric patient you can also use ketamine 10 to mg you give it as a bolus and then give an infusion of 1 to 3 mg per kg per hour okay you can also use iv magnesium 50 mg per kg iv over 20 minutes to a maximum of 2 grams then there is another wonder drug which is epinephrine or adrenaline you can give it in nebulized form 5 ml of 1 is to 1000 or you can give intravenous 10 micrograms that is 1 in 10,000 dilution 0.1 ml you can give 100 micrograms 1 ml of 1 in 10,000 titrated to the response you can give up to 100 micrograms or, or if the intravenous line is worst is not working then you can give intramuscular and also there are many studies which have shown that heliox can be used to maintain a laminar airflow in case of bronchial asthma because there is a turbulent airflow in the asthma in bronchoconstriction so to make it laminar heliox have been proven to be beneficial at a ratio of 80 is to 20 of helium and oxygen or 70 is to 30 okay and also nitroglycerin has been used in some cases by its direct smooth muscle relaxation effect it can cause bronchodilation then iprotropium bromide can be used nebulized form 0.5 mg 6 hourly and also there is aminophilin 5 to 7 mg per kg iv over 30 minutes then 0.5 to 0.9 mg per kg per hour can be used and if you if the person is already using oral theophylline preoperatively then you can skip the loading dose or you can reduce the loading dose by 50 percent all right this is very very important slide it will help you in the in your lifetime just take a screenshot and keep it with you okay now just tell let me tell you a word about status asthmaticus it refers to the acute asthma attacks in which the degree of bronchial obstruction is either severe from the onset or worsens and it is not relieved by the usual therapy in 30 to 60 minutes it is not relieved within one hour then it is called a status asthmaticus and the term refractory status asthmaticus is also there which describes those cases in which the patient's condition continues to deteriorate despite the aggressive pharmacological interventions and it persists for more than 24 hours it is called as refractory status asthmaticus now this can be treated with mechanical ventilation you have to give deep sedation you can use ketamine and inhalational agents like halothane or seboflurane and in this context deep sedation is important not only to improve the oxygenation but also to reduce the cerebral metabolic requirements and the last resort is always the extracorporeal life support all right now this patient how will you do the post-operative care obviously good analysis is the most primary thing okay so you can do analysis by the regional nerve blocks patient control analysis or epidural analysis depends upon the surgery paracetamol is a good an alternative if you want to give non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs then go for paracetamol which is better than those if, if acute bronchospasm occurs towards the end of the case, give post-operative mechanical ventilation and allow time for the recovery of the airway. Give four to six hours of mechanical ventilation, which will help you uh, to be safe. Okay. Then head up position and oxygen administration as required depending upon the surgery and the patients. Now use warm humidified gases only because bronchospasm can be provide, uh, provoked by the cold inspired gases. Okay. Use warm humidified gases, oxygen bronchodilator therapy and corticosteroids have to be given in the post-operative period also as required then you can give incentive spirometry after a few hours of surgery then deep breathing exercises early mobilization all this can be done then chest physiotherapy and chest x-ray if you are suspecting more bronchospasm or fall in the saturation or wheezing again in the post-op or you want to see the response then you can go for the chest x-ray if you are planning for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation if the bronchospasm is still not relieved 
or there was a episode of bronchospasm the uh, just before the, or after the tracheal extubation and now you don't want to put an ET tube again you can go for a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation if the patient is completely conscious and able to take the NIV. So these are my references. I hope uh, this lecture was useful too. Uh, previously we made a le lecture already. This is the second lecture in this series. If, if you feel this is helping out, comment uh, in the comment section below and do like the video and share with your colleagues. Sharing is caring. So share with your colleagues and let them know that there is a YouTube channel in this way. So I hope everyone who has completed their final examinations have done well in their exams. And uh, people who are in third year now, I want you to watch these videos, prepare well for your final examinations. Don't get panicked just one to two months before the exam. So anyways, see you in the next video guys. Thank you so much.